Schatz ist. Well, that didn't take long. What was set up as the slugfest of the session, limiting the governor's powers during an emergency, some senators stepped back and agreed with the governor's veto. On second thought, there's a long way to go. However, on the House side, they haven't seemed to stop with their tinkering of Idaho's institutions of higher learning. Another bill introduced late session to address social justice education. Bringing the nostalgia back for longtime Boiseans. This brother and sister team are reminding us why Boise is so unique and still so loved. Well, just like the Titanic we talked about last week, which was called the unsinkable ship, Senate Bill 1136 was touted as a veto proof piece of legislation. Except we all know what happened to the Titanic. See last week on Friday, Governor Brad Little vetoed two bills. That's House Bill 135 and Senate Bill 1136. Both would shift some of the governor's powers during an emergency to the legislature. Something Little said could be catastrophic, especially during times of immediate need. The bills politicize our emergency response efforts and jeopardize critical funding for local governments during large scale events. The entire legislative body, 105 individuals, would have to convene in Boise to an extend an emergency declaration requested by Lewis County for months long flooding totally impractical and costly. Okay, so that was Friday. Well, then shortly after, lawmakers issued their own statements promising to override those vetoes, claiming they had the votes to do so. But in the end, they didn't. Roll call shows 23 ayes, 12 nays, zero absent and excused, having failed to achieve a two-thirds majority vote. The go the uh, override Senate Bill 1136. The governor's veto is sustained and this bill will be filed in the office of the secretary. Yeah, it's kind of hard to follow by voting no you over it's anyway. The Senate failed to override the veto basically by just two votes. They needed two thirds majority 24 votes. They got 23, meaning S uh, the Senate Bill 1136 will not become law. But our count, though, five Republican senators, the reason this happened, five of them changed their vote from supporting the bill to ultimately supporting the governor. Senators Guthrie, Martin, Patrick, Woodward, and Lodge. Senator Patty Ann Lodge sent us this explanation of her reversal just a short time ago, saying she had planned to support leadership as these bills made their way through the process. But in the end, the governor had to do what he and four former governors supported, veto the bills. I listened to the remarks of the governors, Senator Lodge said, and read their comments. In the end, I feel the governor's ability to protect the state and its people is placed in harm's way by both Senate Bill 1136A and House Bill 135. This legislative session has proven that 105 people from all parts of this state have differences. Look at the length of this session. To think they could come to a quick consensus in an emergency situation is hard to believe. Legislators do not have quick access to experts in emergency situations. The legislature is a deliberative body, Senator Lodge went on, not one to make quick decisions. Senator Lodge went on to say she was concerned about suspending regulations, restricting access and rights to assemble, even closing businesses during a disaster like flood, or earthquakes, believing there are times when these things need to be done to protect people. The senator hopes when the emotion of COVID subsides, that cooler heads might be able to come together and work together for better solutions in the best interest of Idahoans. As for House Bill 135, that is yet to be voted on in the House. Again, though, it would need a two thirds majority vote before it is sent over to the Senate side for another two thirds vote. Um, the purpose of this legislation is to provide for dignity and non-discrimination in public education and to establish fiscal policy relative to sectarian tenants. The latest effort by this legislative session to have a say in what is being taught in Idaho schools comes at the language and intent listed in House Bill 375. Introduced by, you just heard, Representative Julianne Young from Blackfoot into the House Ways and Means Committee this afternoon. So what are sectarian tenets she referred to? Representative Young spelled them out in the bill that tenets of sectarianism, such as critical race theory, beliefs that exacerbate and inflame divisions on the basis of sex, race, race ethnicity, religion, color, national origin, or other criteria in ways contrary to the unity of the nation and the well-being of the state of Idaho and its citizens. 
contrary to the unity of the nations, he says. Things like any sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, or national origin is inherently superior or inferior. That people are be treated poorly based on their sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, or national origin. That people based on those categories are inherently responsible for actions committed in the past by other members of the same category. Well, those beliefs that have kept us all unified since day one, that's what she was referring to. It was just a five minute meeting this afternoon, but there was time for Representative Alana Rubel to throw out a question. Uh, young Mr. Chairman, I'm looking at the um, page two, line three, where it says no educational materials advocating sectarianism shall be used or introduced in any institution of higher education. Um, does that mean they may not even be discussed for purposes of explaining why they may be wrong? And I guess it built into that is how are um, history teachers, for example, to address um, such materials that played a critical role in history if they can't be used in any way or even discussed? You know, I would prefer not to dive too deeply into this since this is a print hearing. However, um, I will refer you to Article 9, Section 6 of the Idaho Constitution. This seems like it would put really undue restrictions on what can be discussed and what can be read in classrooms to the point that I, I don't honestly know how professors or teachers could operate in a meaningful manner. Um, and so for that um, reason, um, for an undue restraint on speech and academic freedom, I'm going to be voting no. And Representative Rubel did vote no, so did two other of her colleagues. But it did pass along party lines 43. Representative Jason Monks from Meridian thought it was fair language, that it was simply spelling out schools could not use materials that, quote, advocated for discrimination or hatred. That also kind of takes away, as Representative Rubel pointed out, an element of free speech. What if a high school student wanted to do a paper on the history of hate groups in Idaho, for example? Would they be able to find materials about that subject in their school library? Or what if a University of Idaho student wanted to learn more about the manifesto Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler to learn how such political ideologies are formed. And in this, isn't this kind of tenet teaching already addressed in Idaho's educational system? You heard Representative Young mention Article 9, Section, section six, 6, that is, of the Constitution, which says, no sectarian or religious tenets or doctrines shall ever be taught in the public schools, nor shall any distinction or classification of pupils be made on account of race or color. No books, papers, tracts, or documents of a political, sectarian, or denominational character shall be used or introduced in any schools established under the provisions of this article, or that school or teacher basically won't get paid. So it seems that whole part is covered, right, with Idaho's Constitution, other than sliding in the part, the term that's been trotted out a lot lately, critical race theory, which, once again, we have asked and have yet to see any evidence of being taught in Idaho schools. But that hasn't seemed to stop legislators from, well, repeating it. So when we left you Friday afternoon, the fate over Senate Bill 1110 was still kind of up in the air. The proposed law would require the signatures of 6% of registered voters in all 35 Idaho districts. And right now, it's just 6% of districts of registered voters in 18 districts. So expand that significantly. Some say it would make it nearly impossible, though, to get future voter initiatives on the ballot. Others claim it gives a vote to rural Idahoans. The governor had until Saturday morning to either sign it or veto it, or just let it go and it would just automatically become law. Well, Lito vetoed similar legislation back in 2019, saying he was concerned a federal court could find it unconstitutional and dictate Idaho's ballot initiative process. So we didn't know if this would be a similar situation, but with minutes to spare, he did sign it. In his transmittal letter, Governor Little said, yeah, back in 2019, I did veto. Senate Bill 1159 and House Bill 296 because he had serious concerns for the constitutionality of both and the unintended consequences of their passage. While he supported the legislature's goal of ensuring the rights of all Idahoans two years ago to have a voice in Idaho's initiative process, he believed those bills back then went too far. This time around, Governor Little said, quote, I have similar concerns with S Senate Bill 1110, but I believe the bill presents a much closer call. Whether Senate Bill 1110 amounts to an impermissible restriction in violation of our Constitution is highly fact dependent and ultimately a question for the Idaho judiciary to decide, which looks like they're going to because to the courts it goes. Prior to signing it, Reclaim Idaho, the group responsible for getting Medicaid expansion, 
which was the last voter initiative to get on the ballot. Well, they gathered more than 16,000 signatures, urging the governor to veto Senate Bill 1110. Wasn't enough, obviously. Governor Little has said in the past that he doesn't want our ballots cluttered with voter initiatives, something that's common with other states. But since 1996, we've talked about this before. In the last 25 years, there was just been 10 voter initiatives and four referendums that have made it onto Idaho's ballots. And of those, two initiatives passed, Idaho State Tribal Gaming Compact in 2002 and Medicaid expansion in 2018. We've asked for information on how many emails and phone calls the governor's office received about this initiative's bill prior to the governor signing it into law. We're gonna let you know as soon as we find out. Well, here's something we do know, industrial hemp, now legal in Idaho. On Friday, Governor Little signed House Bill 126, which immediately ends Idaho's distinction as the last state to legalize hemp for cultivation by Idaho farmers. It also means hemp can now be transported and processed in the state as long as it contains no more than three tenths of a percent of THC. THC is the ingredient in marijuana that gets you, well, high, and that amount is low enough that it, uh, the products have no intoxicating effect. But don't expect to see that crop just start popping up in Idaho farms anytime soon. The Idaho Farm Bureau, which, who proposed this bill, says the process of setting up the new regulation system for industrial hemp would take long enough that the first hemp growing season means it likely wouldn't start until 2022, so at least another year. While growing hemp is legal now, selling products containing it still aren't. Things like CBD oil still cannot contain any trace of THC. It's an ode to the good old days. Just one week into their business venture, this brother and sister duo are bringing all the Idaho feels. Get ready for a blast from the past. In the meantime, you can hit us with your current questions and comments about the show or pretty much anything. Text them to this number, 208-321-5614. Just make sure to include your name and the hashtag, the 208. There's a new business in Boise that's been going steady for about, well, six days now. It's a homegrown company. One, because it's headquartered in a home. And two, it's all about being homegrown, that is, growing up in Boise. The idea for Boise OG began about six months ago, the brainchild of Kelly Knopp and his sister Heidi. Their family moved to Idaho from California back in the mid-80s, so they've been here a while. They started out in Pocatello and then ended up in Boise a couple years later. And like a lot of longtime locals, they look back on those late 20th century days with great fondness. Maybe you've been in Boise long enough that you remember a drive to Caldwell felt like a day long road trip. Did for Kelly. Well, then this might be for you. And even if you haven't been in Boise that long, this could still be for you. Kelly told us today he and his sister came up with Boise OG, the same place most good ideas are born over a beverage. And honestly, it was her idea to do this sort of nostalgic Boise stuff or just like, you know, these things about like what make Boise so unique. So Boise OG is kind of a look back for long timers and a history lesson for newcomers. If you didn't grow up here or you didn't experience a lot of sort of the changes of Boise, there's going to be a lot of things that you wouldn't know unless you were originally here. 
Like, if you can flash back to Saturdays at Skate World, or summers on Simplot Hill, or when Garden City's leading landmark was on wheels, then you likely can't forget pineapples on porches either. And every time we like, hey, do you remember? And then, you know, everyone has their own story about that. And like someone would spin off and say, hey, what about? And so it's turned into this crazy thing. And long story short, Kelly's printer in his studio has been pushing out stickers nonstop. Not that he's complaining. It's really fun and it always brings a smile to people's face just to reminisce about like the way things used to be. And, and we're definitely not taking a stand if we don't want anything to change. It's more of like, as things are changing so fast, we want to kind of preserve and just kind of remember what made Boise so great to begin with. One of my favorites just kind of proves in the website is the one with the old farmer saying, I remember when that was farmland. Yeah, and I, I grew up with my, my dad saying that out the window on our way to Meridian. Um, you know, I had to roll my eyes and now I say it to my girls. So uh, it's, uh, we get a lot of comments on that one of like, everyone said it for sure. Yeah. Do you have a favorite that you look at? Um, you know, my favorite is the I Survived Camel's Back. Um, people don't remember that original playground. I mean, it was kind of like a Thunderdome, like between the hot slides and, and just the, uh, the old school playgrounds where safety wasn't quite the priority. The nostalgic part is cool, remembering how things used to be. But what's it been like for you to kind of put all this together? It's been a ton of fun. Um, you know, me and my sister have become a lot closer just realizing that like we had a lot of the same experiences and favorite spots, but then just having just having this community of people that in my head, I'm kind of imagining like, hey, were we in the same line at Wild Waters when we were nine? And you know what I mean? Like, or were we at the same Camel's Back Park that we both remember? And so it's kind of this like, this community um, that grew up here is sort of coming back together with these sort of memories. And, and maybe that effect is too, when, when, you know, people are moving here and learning about what's great about Boise now, they can sort of take a moment and be like, wow, this, this place has evolved and, um, and I can appreciate what it used to be. The Greenbelt Etiquette Enforcement. Oh yeah, Kelly told us they've had about 300 orders since Tuesday. That was when they officially started last week with most people buying multiple stickers and hats in many in several orders. The t-shirts, they're coming starting with the Camel's Back special and they hope to get into glassware soon, so stay tuned for that. The workflow is Heidi comes up with the ideas and Kelly creates the look. Now we didn't just do this as a free ad. We just thought it was a great way like Heidi and Kelly do to appreciate the uniqueness of Boise's history and for those taking the reins of its future. The best thing since sliced bread, huh? Well, this Idaho landmark is literally sliced bread. Kinda, sort of, at least according to its name. Have another hidden gem we should visit or know of another interesting nugget we should uncover? Tell us about it. Just text the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. We love hearing about it. We also love knowing your name and we want to see the hashtag, the 208.
It's a somewhat famed and fabled slice of life, but unseen by many. Breadloaf Rock, that is. After old Highway 55 shut down and the current highway shifted its route toward the east, it's not easily seen from Highway 55 unless you know exactly where to look. 22 years ago today, John Miller made the trip toward Horseshoe Bend to show us what could be the makings of the world's largest bologna sandwich. How in the world a giant boulder becomes a giant loaf of bread is anyone's guess. That's way beyond me. But the folks up at the Long Branch Cafe have a theory. Well, it's just a freak of nature. It's an old time. Older than you, huh? Right. All I know, it's been there since 1947. 54 years, anyway. Oh, it's that close. Oh, I'd never, I'd never guess. You know, a rock is a rock. <laughs> Except, old Bill Kelly says, when it's shaped like a loaf of bread. How many times have you been out there? None. That's too much walking for me. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, well, we'll just head out by ourselves then, I guess, huh? Yeah, it's a good trip. You pack a lunch when you head out there? Well, I would if I went. Bring some bologna? Yeah, sure. All right. Make ourselves a bread loaf rock bologna sandwich, there huh? There you go, right. That's a good idea. That's about all there is at Breadloaf Rock, <laughs> except some graffiti. Well, the school kids. They've been coming here at least 33 years, and the pioneers before them. The old timers guessed the big bread loaf was left behind by old Paul Bunyan. That's all I know about it. So why aren't you going out there? Why should I? I didn't lose anything there. You didn't lose anything there? Nope. Don't expect to find anything nope. there, huh? Nope. Except now, a fairly weathered piece of bologna stuck to what might be the eighth wonder bread of the world. Well, that's about it, I guess. John Miller, Idaho's News Channel 7. <laughs> Didn't stick very long, did it? We're told high school students, other than the graffiti, they've kept it painted white over the years. Kind of like the wonder bread, right? You can get a, glim a glimpse of that bread loaf rock from old Highway 55, but be careful the road isn't maintained anymore. And as again, as you know where to look, you can still kind of see it from the current highway. And it's also located on private property, which has changed hands a couple of times since that story. Yeah, t-shirts and flip-flops probably this weekend to windbreakers and tennis shoes today. Quick change from 24 hours ago here in the Treasure Valley. But before the wind moved in, the temperatures dropped. You were able to capture some pretty incredible images of just how beautiful Idaho looks in spring.
Oh, here we are. Let's look at our comments here for the last minute of the show. Let's get to this one from Steve. Instead of supporting the people of Idaho, our governor signs Senate Bill 1110. He could have signed it and challenged our legislators to override his veto and be the ones who sent it to the courts, but didn't have the courage to do what he did back in 2019. So that's a lot of theories that people haunted. Let them take care of it in the legislature, just like what Lewis here in Eagle says. What's up with the governor? First, he vetoes the bill when the legislature takes away executive power, but then he turns around and signs a bill taking away citizens initiative power, which is a sentiment a lot of people shared. Finally, Idaho's going to pot, says Susan. We're going to hemp, unless you're talking about something else. I'm not sure. We used to pack snacks to go over to Karcher Mall. It was a big deal, but it was worth it. Only place to get an Orange Julius. Oh, Orange Julius. See you tomorrow.